Well, Juan Giorno, Judy, or in Donna's case, good afternoon, since she's joining us from Europe and we have a time difference. And that's sort of the sum of my great Italian to start this off. <laughs> <It'll> <laughs> and get I'm, really, coffee anyway. <laughs> I'm really delighted to be spending another hour with Donna Leon, one of my favorite authors, and I have, for proof, and I have followed her entire career, I went and found oh in my, my own library, both my American wow. and British copies of Death at La Fenice, which was her first mystery time. for Commissario Guido Brunetti. And, and it was a revenge novel, but set. I think that's a fair statement, don't you, Donna, to say it was a revenge novel? Yeah. And set um, in Venice, in La Fenice is Venice's storied opera house. Unfortunately, it burned down some years ago. And so the current La Fenice is not the, um, the one that, that we tend to think of. When was the original La Fenice built, Donna? 1712, maybe. And it burned down and then it was rebuilt in the 18th century. And that was the one that burned down in 90 something, I think. Yeah. It and now it's been now building. it's been restored. Did they did they bring it back to the way it was, or is this an all new building? Um, no, it's it's some of the walls are original, but it was completely gutted. It burned for a long time, and it was it was a combination of incompetence and and the unthinkable. They had drained the canal and back of the theater. So when there was a fire, the fire boats, which usually are in the canals, they couldn't get there. And so the firemen, they, they were really quite valiant, I, I must say. They got to within um, a half a city block of it, which was as close as the, as the fire boats could get. And the, the firemen went up on the roofs with the hoses and stood on the roofs, but it, it was hopeless. They had a helicopter that was dropping, uh, I think a thousand liters of water a pop on it, but that didn't help. It burned to the ground, it burned all night. And I could see it from my window. I could see it from my living room window. So you were still living in Venice when that happened? Yeah, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And when did you, when did you move to Switzerland? I moved about uh, two years ago, two or three years ago. But it, it had become increasingly not, I won't say unpleasant, but it had become increasingly not pleasant to live in Venice because there were 50,000 of us, 50,000 residents, and 30 million tourists. And when you work those, those numbers, it's, uh, it's Oxford Street on Christmas Eve, every day. Oh, it's, yeah, it's a real, real fishbowl. And that, that's been true of cities like Barcelona, um, you know, other, I, and then the pandemic, I think gave citizens a chance to sort of reclaim their cities. Um, yeah. when travel was off and one hopes. I think Venice, if I recall right, has taken the step of moving the cruise ships out of the city. There's a terminal now. That, yeah. I mean, the tourists are still there because they come in, but the big ships, it's really bizarre to be in Venice and one of these giant ships would come in and dwarf um, all of the architecture that you were there. They'll be back. If they're not back, they'll be back. But because oh. the city administration says, oh, we can have these big ships. So they want them because they bring money. Well, that's the that's the draw is that you know it's a big economic thing to have tourists, but hard on residents. In any case, you you travel back and forth to Venice, which um, um, we're still in Venice with Guido Brunetti, and as as this this book is really in many ways um, a delve back into Guido's past, and I really enjoyed that, Donna, because the woman Elizabeth uh, was it Elisabetta Foscarini. Mm -hmm. who kind of kicks off the plot as somebody from Brunetti's childhood, a woman who he thought was kind to his mother. Yeah, who Brunetti's mother seems to become more and more important in the books as he get old, gets older. I think that as we get older and we become our parents' age and begin to see things as our parents might have seen them with just a little bit of wisdom and a little bit of tolerance and a little bit of understanding more than we had in youth. I think we think more about them because we now in a sense are becoming them. 
those deep rooted ideas that we have, those deep rooted principles that we have, I think they come back more strongly when we're older. Maybe, maybe only because we're weaker, I don't know. And this is happening to Brunetti. So when this woman from his past who knew him 50 years before, 40 years before, pops in and asks a favor, he is, um, he remembers her mother and her mother was good to his family. And so he feels a profound obligation to help her. He, doesn't really, he, he never really liked her very much. And he doesn't like her very much now because she's not a particularly likable person, but he will do what he, has, what he feels he has to do out of a sense of, sense of, of loyalty to his family. So even at the beginning, his, the, the, the dynamics are very confused. Well, they are. I misspoke because Elisabetta is actually the age, roughly the age of Brunetti or slightly, she older. She was slightly older, wasn't she? Yeah, she was two or three years older. Right. And so it was his mother that um, was very good to Brunetti. And Brunetti, you know, he's, he's always had a kind of interesting relationship with his in-laws, the Falieris. And mm -hmm. I thought that this book not only um, allows us to see a lot more of Brunetti's family and Brunetti when he was young, but he's mellowed more towards the Falieri. He's more comfortable with both his, his mother-in-law and his father-in-law. Mm -hmm. He was prickly um, for a long time. And, and I think he felt, I mean, as you portrayed him, I don't, I'm not entirely sure whether he felt um, a class difference or whether he was defensive because um, he, he came from a, a different social strata. Mm -hmm. uh, what, what, what was his um, discomfort with the Falieris for so long? Well, he was raised in a, in a poor family, not, not, a, not a, a middle class family or a lower middle class. Family. They were poor. They were poor people because his father was very much damaged by the Second World War, damaged in, in the, way he, the way he thought. And his mother was an uneducated person. She had gone, I think, to four years of school or six years of school. And so he was always sensitive to this. And he, as a, a wonder child, went to university, studied law, graduated very well, and decided to, be, to become a policeman. But he's always got that, that dark shadow in his past because he, he's, He's a social riser. He's not a social climber. He fell in love with a woman and married her because he was just bananas for her. She happens to be the daughter of one of the wealthiest people in the city who was also a count. And so he has taken giant steps up the social ladder, which was not his intention because he was in love with a woman who just happened accidentally to be. She's, he's not the classic... Um, gigolo going after the, the, uh, the wealthy woman. And because of that, because of the difference in their social status, he's very often uncomfortable because he, he, he sort of has a feeling that he's, he's there by acceptance, sort of. They, yeah, well, let's, let's invite Paula. Oh yeah, we have to invite Guido too, because he's the, he's the, the odd man out in their social circle. But he's always managed, because he's smart, he's, he's not only intelligent, but he's, very, he's clever about people. So he knows how to adjust himself to any social situation, which he does repeatedly. So there are two children. How did they get along with their Falieri grandparents? They seem to adore them because they are, they would not have that problem because they were born into their mother's wealth or the, the wealth of circumstance. They, they are surrounded, the Falieris live in this enormous palazzo on the Grand Canal. The Brunettis live in a, a three bedroom apartment, not on the Grand Canal. So there's always this difference in um, economy between them. But the, and this is something I realize that I'm using more and more in books. Conte Faliere is a reader and Brunetti is a reader, and Paola is a reader. And between and among them, there is the, well, you're a reader. So you know yeah. 
you know that, that that bond, and I imagine many of the people who are watching are readers. And so when they, they find that someone that they meet, and you struggle for that common, what can we talk about? And you find that that person is a reader, everything's fine. You can be on a train from Venice to, to Zurich and you'll talk about books all the time. It, it's, I don't wanna use the word religion because I, that's, that's mistaken. But there is a kind of, in my experience, there is a kind of unity among readers. It's as if it's a secret club and you find someone and they say, yeah, but have you read these? I just read this fabulous. And if someone says, yeah, I've read it too, isn't it great? Particularly, and then you start about the scene, the gambling scene or the great horse race scene. And all of a sudden you've bonded with someone yes. you never met before. It is, it is absolutely a community in the same way that you and I both, you know, love opera and belong to kind of an opera community. I've got I think, a little- I think those people are a little bit less stable. You think so? Okay. Um, as a tribute to Donna, I'm actually reading <laughs> my morning tea and my mug from the Santa Fe Opera with a musical theme since over the years we've exchanged many notes about, about opera and singers and, mm -hmm. you know, the whole joy. And in fact, Donna, um, has a, a whole, you, you, you might, we might digress here. What is going on with your own musical life? Because you've supported a group for quite a long time, or you're part of a group. No, I've supported them. Um, uh, first, Il Contrazo Barocco with Alan Curtis, my late friend, Alan Curtis, and now Il Pomodoro, which um, Monday is giving a concert in the New Philharmonie in Hamburg, which is one of the most, uh, acoustically fabulous buildings I've ever been in. Yeah. It's Joyce Di Donato's new Eden project, which is musically fabulous. I, have, I haven't seen it, but I went to the recording. And I heard Joyce sing beautifully for 20 years, but this, this disc is, this disc in this program. I know the disc, the disc is sensational. And I'm hoping that the program, I'm sure the program will be the same on Monday night. Are you going to Hamburg to, to listen to it? Yeah, 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 yeah. And then I go to, um, I go to Zurich. And on Thursday, I see Cecilia uh, Bartoli sing L'Italiana. And then on Saturday, I see Pergolesi's Le, Le Olimpiadi, which I've never seen. Uh, th three people I know are singing, so I'm going sort of as a as a friend. And, and these, uh, all three, uh, one, two, three, all three have some with Pomodoro. So I'm just going to see old friends. How absolutely wonderful that um, things have eased up so that you can return to your musical life, because it's one of the big reasons you live in Europe is that you have access to all these wonderful yeah. singers and productions. When we were in Hamburg, I think it was 2019, right before, no, it was 2018, we went to visit that marvelous building where they, you know, the, and, and unfortunately we weren't able to see a performance, it was sold out, okay. but we did take a tour of the, of the building and the, in the theater, and so you could kind of imagine it, but it's an amazing structure, I think. Yeah, it is, it's, I find it very beautiful, it's, there's no building like it anywhere. No. And the acoustics are sensational. They and really and are. a big theater and a little theater. So the, the, the acoustics, the music has two chances. If it's a small ensemble, it could go into the, into the baby room. And then if it's a grown up ensemble, it can go into the giant hall. Oh, it's just sensational. And Joyce is singing in the big hall, which is enormous, but she'll fill it. She'll fill it vocally. I'm sure she will. One of the other things about it that's wonderful is it's right on the water. So it has a little bit of um, a Venetian. And actually the Sydney Opera House does the same thing, doesn't it, Donna? Because the Opera House is boutique and yet the Symphony Hall, everybody thinks that the Sydney Opera House, the big structure is the Opera House, but it isn't. It's the Symphony and then the Opera is much smaller and has benches on banc like Drottningholm or something. So, you know, it's not, I wouldn't describe it as super comfortable. 
of <laughs> to see a performance, but there we are. Anyway, we digress into music yeah. as we often do when we talking to each other. But um, Donna is, is uh, in this book, among all the other joys of this particular book, is that Guido, and Paolo is always reading, but Guido retreats into books. And in fact, at the very end on page 90, He's looking at Artemis Doris's on the interpretation of dreams, mm -hmm. and this the the whole situation in this book is so uncomfortable for him that I think he retreats into literature, doesn't he? In part, as a kind of escape. Yeah. Oh, also, he's he's always reading what I'm reading, and oh. I I read a review of this book four or five years ago, and I bought it. I loved it because I I don't I don't believe any of this stuff about dreams. I don't think they they foresee or they, they talk about the bad. In fact, one thing that fascinates me about dreams is that today, when people talk about their dreams, they talk about the way they're bringing back the past memories. I'm finding, I'm, I'm, uh, I, I, my psychiatrist read, interpreted my dreams and he said that this meant that I, when I was six, whereas, in classic times, people interpreted dreams to be about the future. They, they were magic indications of what was going to happen. So if you could interpret the dreams properly, and the interpretations are wildly different from all this Freudian stuff, you would know the future. Whereas the, with Freud, if you understand the dreams, you would understand the past. And I find this a fascinating difference between two cultures and two, two mindsets. Indeed. Um, and, you know, I, I meant to haul us back to the conversation about family, because thinking about when I asked you about if Guido and Paolo's children got along with the Falieres, I also remember that before Guido's mother died, and she was in a, uh, at one point in a, uh, institution, okay. whatever you want to call it, that, that Guido's children were very fond of their maternal grandmother and spent a lot of time. She lived with them for a while, right? Until mm -hmm. she eventually had to move to care and then yeah. eventually died. So the, the kids have the contrast between yeah. this, this very simple woman who was very, very clever, but uneducated. She's very much like a neighbor I had in the mountains. I, I used to have a a summer place in, in the mountains, about 50 miles, 100 miles north of Venice. And my neighbor was a woman who was, I don't know, 20 years older than I, who had lived through the war, who had been poor, but poor in, in ways that we can't understand, dirt poor for much of her life. And she had to go away from school when she was in the fourth grade because the family needed, and this was in, I don't know, before the, first, the Second World War, because the family needed her to work in the fields because the, everything was done by hand and her family was a farming family. So she, she left school at four, uh, in the fourth grade, but she, was, she never read. She read in uh, La Voce del Popolo, which was the church's little four page brochure that came every week and never read anything, didn't watch television much, but she was just smart about how to get through life. And, and I, I admired her enormously. She was, she was a, a, an extraordinary woman with fourth grade education. Well, like it, you know, over the course of the books, because you know you've taken us on a on a journey through the life of Guido and his family, we have had people like Guido's mother um, be in the book, and her life changed, and then eventually she's died and left us. The children are growing up. Um, the Fieri's are getting older, and in this particular book, and we can talk about why it's called "Give Unto Others," but not at the moment. Um, I think the problem, the problem, the problem Guido faces, the real problem he faces is um, where does his loyalty lie? And can he, as an official policeman, as a commissario, can he actually take on um, doing an investigation that's really off the books that would be essentially more like that of a private inquiry agent? And, and can he bring in his usual 
cohorts like Signora Electra yeah. or, you know, and then there's the evil Lieutenant Scarpa who, you know, is always off there being, I'm never sure what Scarpa's game is, you know, where his I haven't figured lies. it out. I, I haven't figured him out. I've, I've, I've put the black finger on him. He's a, he's a bad guy, but he's never done anything bad. He's sarcastic. He's disrespectful to, to his colleagues. Uh, Pata adores him. That's always a, a black mark against anyone. But even even with Pata, this this interests me more because Pata has so much more presence in the books. Pata has never been a bad policeman. He's never taken a bribe. He's never done anything really dishonest. He's just the boss that we all had most of our lives. He's he's pumped up. He's he's self important. He's lazy. He always wants all of, all of the, the gratitude and all of the praise for whatever good happens. Who hasn't worked for Pata? He, but he's not a bad guy. And yet, I think people who read the books, when Pata comes, they see, they see the black mus the Simon Legree top hat and the cape. But he's never done anything bad. And he adores his family. He adores his kids. He'll do anything for his kids or his wife. But he's not really a policeman. I mean, he's really a politician, yeah, you know, a politician. in a policeman's role. And that's what's infuriating <laughs> that's is that he's much more interested in his image and in the politics of the office than he uh -huh. is. And, you know, that, that's, that's been portrayed in various crime fiction, um, various, you know, it, what do you do with the, with the policeman who's more outfacing than, you mm -hmm. know, than he is and actually interested in the job or determined to climb a ladder. Although Pot has been basically in the same position, hasn't he, throughout the series? Yeah. No, he, he was, hasn't advanced up the, you no, know, up the ladder no, he, to some, like he's not the minister of justice or whatever it might be. That's sort of the situation in the book. I, I never realized that I, 30 years later, I would still be writing these books, but there, the, there's, a, there's a certain evolutionary slowness Evolution has been slowed down in these books because nobody's getting much older. Because I can't, I can't let be, because they started out in middle age. So they don't have, if Brunetti had been 15 when I started the books, great, it would work now. But people, it, but it's very much like, uh, what's her name? Um, a, B, C, D. Um, what was her, what was her name? She died a few years ago, unfortunately. The, the mystery writer with the A is for B is for. Oh, Sue Grafton. Sue Grafton, yeah, may right. she rest in peace. She, she also locked, she locked the time box. Yeah. And well, it, eventually, it yeah, eventually the alphabet series became historical, you know, um, because it, it never moved out of the 1980s mm -hmm. for a lot of reasons, mostly that a private investigator today is much more about technology than they are about shoe leather. And, and Sue wanted Kinsey, you know, to remain the kind of private investigator that, mm -hmm. that we all knew back in the, in the 20th century. Mm -hmm. You know, she didn't want her to be a hacker or somebody, if, you know, spent their life. People like that. A willing suspension of disbelief. Yeah. Uh, I, I've never had anyone register a complaint that Guido was, you know, not aging fast enough. <laughs> I, I myself think that readers collaborate with the author in that. Um, and the people who have chosen to, the authors who have chosen to age their characters in real time have run into some real problems, mm -hmm. you know, and that they've gotten too old for the job. Um, yeah. I could, I can cite Nevada Bar, who's Ranger and a pigeon got too old for the kind of finish, physical punishment that Nevada thought was appropriate. Or Michael Conley, Harry Bosch is now out of the LAPD and in his new incarnation as a private investigator. Ian Rankin, same problem with um, um, his sleuth. So, you know, I, I think we're all perfectly happy that time passes very slowly. Good. And, Good. Um, you know, that, that, I mean, you've allowed the kids to grow up some and, you yeah. know, everybody to age sort of gently. Don't we wish that we, well, actually you and I are doing that. Let's be real here. <laughs> yeah, give me a ticket for that one. Yeah. We are. Um, so why, 
why is the book called Give Unto Others? And the answer is that somewhere in this book, there is a charitable thing going on, um, mm -hmm. which we won't want to talk about much. But at the same time, um, I think we should all be, as, as the, you know, with the horrible war and the Ukraine is going on, everybody's moved to, you know, not everybody, but people are moved to be charitable, you know, mm -hmm. to donate or to try to, to help and so forth. Mm -hmm. And where does all that go? You know, where do the clothes go? Where does the money go? Who's paying well, attention to all of it? There are many, many Ukrainians coming into the main train station in in Berlin. Um, a friend of mine works for, he is a lawyer for the, the, tr the, the train company. And she, I think she said the other night at dinner that the tickets are free. Um, Deutsche Bahn is allowing people, Ukrainians to come to Berlin to go anywhere free on trains in, in Germany. And a lot of people, he, I, I'm in Berlin at the moment. A lot of people here are taking people into their homes. In fact, I was, I was coming to visit a friend yesterday and the woman who lives downstairs from my friend said, oh, hi, Donna, how are you? Blah, 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 blah. And then she said, these are my new friends. No, 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 a woman and two kids. This is Dimitri and Anna. And she said, um, they've come from Kiev. And her message was, bright and cheerful. These are traumatized people. So I said, oh, good. How nice of you. Um, what are you going to do? And she said, well, they're staying, they're staying with us. She lives in an apartment. I don't, I've never been in the apartment, but it's not big with her husband and her son. But she has opened her home to a 39-year-old woman and her two teenage kids because she picked them up at the train station and brought them home. Wow. With, with filling out all of the forms. And there are lots of people in Germany doing this. I haven't been in any other country since, since this war started. But my sense is that the Germans are responding with, um, literally with open arms. Well, it's certainly clear that many of them have gone to Poland. In fact, I think I read that yeah. Polish cities feel like they have absorbed as many as they can. And, you know, a lot of what will happen will depend on whether whether they're ever able to go home again. Um, and you never know that, you know, we had um, back when Castro, back in whenever that was, um, yeah. many Cubans fled to the United States, but it never resolved in their favor and they're still here. And they, they form a very potent community in, in Florida, particularly in Miami, mm -hmm. which became essentially a kind of Cuba um, outside of Cuba. And so we can't tell right now, you know, whether the Ukrainians will be able to go home or whether they're going to be permanent exiles. It's difficult to know right at the moment. I, I think that, that Germany does merit great praise for this because yeah. how many years ago was it that they, they took in a million non-Europeans yeah. when nobody else, when other people were just pushing them away from the border? But Frau Merkel said, Hey, we ha we have we have to help these people, and I think that feeling has continued into this this new administration. We have to help these people because the other guys on the other side of the line are just going to shoot them in the back if we don't let them in. And that, well, Germany of, is you know happened. it's a big country, and they went through their own kind of refugee absor or at least absorption mm -hmm. process when East Ber you know East Germany yeah. suddenly you know West Germany didn't have to embrace. East Germany the way that it did. So it did, yeah. yeah. Um, so yeah, I'm I'm I mean it's it's difficult to know how this fall. And you wrote this book before all this started. So it yeah. isn't anything you have to be aware of. But there is there is how do you deal with COVID in this book? Do you, you know, because it's a thing, are you referencing it at all? No. I, I reference it, but I I would rather with it just refer to it as a marker in time. People are wearing masks, people are not wearing masks, people remember when, but I, it's not a subject that I want to explore deeply. I don't want to, I don't want to write a COVID book because I, I wouldn't find that interesting. I wouldn't find that interesting. That doesn't mean it's not interesting, but 
I, I couldn't make it be an interesting subject. But certainly it, it has to be acknowledged because it, it is, at, these are the two great issues of, of the, the, the 2020s, the 2020s. But one does not have to spend a lot of time on them because they, they at least the COVID thing has not altered our lives. It's altered our behavior, but I, I don't think it's altered our lives yet. This oh, in some respects, as we already mentioned, it may have improved life for residential Phoenicians and that, you know, they could reclaim their city. Yeah. Venice also has, you know, a long and fascinating history with Mass, um, mm -hmm. you know, Mass for Carnival and yeah. all the rest of it. So I have a little figure in my library that's one of the, you know, the Dottori with the, with the mask. Oh, I should have brought it in with the mask and the, you know, the kind of long snout and the whole thing. So, um, And then it also had to do with plague. It did. Because exactly. they had the plague here often. Oh, I think I think it was interesting that, you know, the mask was sort of an attempt to to do what the COVID masks are trying to do. You know, it was kind of an attempt to shield the wearer from. Yeah, it was. Um, it was. Yeah. yeah it was. From germs. I think it, was, it was successful. In it some was. Cases. Yeah. Well, anyway, give unto others. Um, so, so what we have is Brunetti here who has gotten a, a request for a favor from mm -hmm. Elisabetta, uh, which he feels um, that, he, that he ought to accept because of their family mm -hmm. history. And inevitably, well, starts, he draws in starts. other people to it. Speaking. What What was her original request for a favor? We can at least mention that, although we don't want to unravel the whole plot here and spoil the book. Well, she's concerned about the behavior of her husband and her she's worried about her family and she's legitimately worried. I mean, she's, she's really worried. She's not, she's not pretending to be worried. But the book is, is I don't, I don't want to say a warning, but I've, I've lived in a, in a society that has a, a different attitude towards many things. And I have some friends who have been involved in charities in what we, I think it's a natural impulse to help people who are in need. I think it is also a natural impulse in some people to profit from that as much as they can. One has but to read the salaries of people who run charities, people who run NCOs. You, you wonder why they're getting a couple hundred thousand dollars when what their, their purpose is to give money to poor people. It seems to a friend of mine always said that foreign aid was a process by which people, poor people in rich countries, give money to rich people in poor countries. Wow. Isn't that nice? It is very in symmetrical. Too. Poor people in rich countries give money to rich people in poor countries. And I think that that is somewhat true, that much of the money that is meant to, to go to a specific recipient who is in real need gets sidetracked. The Turks, the Turks also, also say, a man who touches honey licks his fingers. And we, I think we respond to these two aphorisms with some strength because we realize that there's a certain inconsistency in the way much charity is dispensed in the world. That well, much of it comes back to the lack of supervision or lack of control. You know, that the impulse to give it is wonderful, but the yeah. oversight um, can be really weak. Um, yeah. And I don't know, you know, do you think it's fair that there's kind of an assumption when reading about Italy that there's going to be corruption do you think that is an even fair um, emotional response? Um, I, I, th I think it's exaggerated. Because one thing about that I have noticed after living in Italy for, for decades is that about some things they aren't hi hypocrites. And many other countries veil themselves in the mask of charity 
but they're also corrupt. Um, one has but to read the newspaper about, look, and an example would be London. Billions have been coming into London for the last years. And only now do people wake up and say, oh, good heavens, this money is stolen from the Russian people. How could this be? How could we have let this happen? You didn't let it happen, you encouraged it. You, made, you changed the law so that people could bring stolen money into England. And now this is, this is the kind of hypocrisy that Italians don't engage in because they just say, oh yeah, well, okay, you were taking bribes, big deal. Whereas the, it, it's this lily white protestation of, of innocence, not only on the part of the English, but on the part of many people, many the, the representatives of many countries who now say, oh, good heavens, have we been allowing these Russian oligarchs to take billions out of that country? And the answer is yes. And you've, been, <laughs> and you've loved it because you've been taking a percentage. Well, if you look at, at the assets of Abramovich, you know, it was an article in the New York Times this morning. I mean, he has his own, you know, Boeing jet. He has super yachts. He has all this other stuff. Mm -hmm. Where did all this money come from? He yeah. certainly didn't yeah, inherit yeah, yeah, yeah. it. Yeah. And I heard someone here, I heard someone here saying, yeah, but you, can, you can't take the money from him because some of it belongs to his daughter. And I looked this, this guy right in the eye and I said, hey, look, if I robbed the bank and I gave you some of the money, could the bank have that money back or not? Does it become your money because I gave it to you? I, the, the, the thinking on this, is, on this particular subject is so, so bizarre. How much thinking on any subject I find in the world today is bizarre. <laughs> bizarre. Um, in, yeah. in your last book, Transient Desires, you know, you wrote about another community that um, could have used a lot more inquiry and supervision than, than it yeah. got. And so here we are with this one. But let's go back to Elisabetta and her daughter, because one of the, one of the um, fun things um, that Donna and I have been talking about before we started this are our mutual love for dogs. Um, mine are locked out, but may join us at any moment. Um, and so Elisabetta's daughter is a veterinarian. Mm -hmm. And how, how does Elisabetta react to that, to her daughter and to her daughter's family? Well, she's, she's worried about her daughter because she doesn't, she doesn't really know what's going on. And, and I think that this, this menace that hovers over people in the book is upsetting to the people who love the people who are menaced. And when, when there is a break-in at the veterinary clinic, the mother is of course, at least a brunetti, deeply concerned about this because one of the dogs was hurt. Luckily her daughter wasn't there, so her daughter wasn't hurt. But this, this shocks her. And, and I, I think as well in the book, there's there's a certain amount of shock in that people very often are not what we want them to be and expect them to be. And I think very often when people behave in a particular way, speak in a certain way and are convincing, we are astonished and very disappointed when they turn out to be something other. And I think that in the world of finance, certainly this is, how many times do we have to be told the same story? before we realize that when a man touches honey, he licks his fingers. One of the, the tragic figure in this book is really the Admiral. Um, yeah. and, and he's about 80, actually he's my age, so I'm having some trouble with that, but anyway. Um, and, and he is suffering from, uh, from dementia mm -hmm. um, or Alzheimer's, whatever it is. But in any case, gradually his, um, mental faculties are being compromised. He has a son who is looking, you know, really loves the old man and looks after him. But, but because this gentleman is, is both powerful and um, heroic and yet, and yet not able to really manage his life anymore, he gets sucked into this. Um, and, you know, it, I mean, he's the one person that, that really there shouldn't be any fallout. Um, to affect him because you know he's a um, 
kind of an unconscious player, whatever you want to call it. He's manipulated and into man. it. He grew, he grew out of a, um, a real person whom I don't know. I have, I have a friend in Venice, a good friend, who is 88 or something, like that, but in, in great shape, runs around. I was at her place for lunch with some friends and there were, there were photographs, old photographs of military officers, Italian with beautiful white, and one of them was with Haile Selassie. And I said, who's this? And she said, oh, that was my grandfather. He was the naval commander at the time. And she started talking about her family. She was Sicilian, she is Sicilian, and Venetian, half, half and half. And I had this image of a, a piano covered with silver framed photos of the guys with the white, white uniforms with like the Russian generals, the, this, this medal and this medal and this medal and this medal. And I couldn't, I couldn't get rid of that. I've always found naval uniforms the most beautiful because they're white. And then with the, the pith helmet, and the little, the little emperor and this towering figure of the Meraglio, he was an admiral. And I thought, when I saw him, I said, he's got to go in the book. I, I have to, I have to use this. But I, I, asked, I asked her if I could use the photograph of her, of her uncle. It was, no, her grandfather in a book and just, just to write about it. And she said, oh, she'd be very pleased. So I, I put her in the book too. I never know, I never know when, when the, the, the light bulb is gonna go boing, boing, boing. And I never know what for. I never know when I'm going to find something that I, I know a book is in there or a character is perfect for a book. It changed, of course, because her, her grandfather was lucid to his last breath. I, I will remember forever the shock of those pho photographs and knowing instantly what they were, but for them to be the grandfather of a friend was, was remarkable. Well, Venice has a storied maritime history, um, yeah. you know, but last time I was there, we went to visit, you know, it's no longer, well, I guess it is the Arsenale, which is the, mm -hmm. uh, um, Construct. I mean, Venice ruled the sea really until Constantinople fell, and um, and then the trade route shifted. But for a long time, the main axis of trade between Asia and Europe went to Constantinople and then up the Adriatic to Venice. And once the Portuguese went around Africa, everything changed, and we moved to a different design. But um, if you sail around the Eastern Mediterranean, in particular, you know a lot of it was ruled by Venice or at least by Venice. You find you it everywhere. You find archaeologically, you find it everywhere. Yeah. And I think that this is part of the the character of the Venetians. Mm -hmm. There's a kind of sad lethargy in many of them. But if you think that for hundreds of years you were the boss, you ruled the world economically, and they they didn't have to fight for it all the time. They fought for it much of the time, but they didn't have to. They didn't have to fight. And they they usually won until the end, until the Ottomans defeated them. And to have ruled a, a small, we're talking a lot, a, a, a teeny number of people, they ruled the world peacefully with their trade ships, yeah. not with their warships, although they had them too. And then to sink into being Disneyland. I think at, at some level, it has to affect them as a people. I've always found them very funny, very generous, very polite. But there's always, in, in my dealings with them, there's always an element of sadness at, at something lost. They, they lost the world. 
That's really you know, enough to be said. It's an interesting thought about how the British have coped since World War II. I think it's less sadness than belligerence, but um, you know, maybe a combination of, of both. And maybe we are, as a nation, going to be facing that as we move into the 21st century. Um, you know, the rise and fall of empires. I'm sure that the Romans um, in the fourth century AD felt a lot differently about Rome than they did, say, in the first century AD when, you know, it was, um, it did rule the world. So there, there are many, many elements in this wonderful book, but I'm going to, I'm going to ask Donna, we exchanged a couple of emails, which I want to go back to dogs. Um, and Donna, <laughs> Donna is very fond of a book um, about dogs. And that's such a great story about you and the book and the author. I wish you'd tell it because I thought it was wonderful. I was at dinner at the home of, a, of a, um, an English friend of mine who has dogs, two dogs in Venice. And the guest, the other guest was someone named Ruth Fogel. When we were introduced, I thought, I know that name, I know that name, I know that name. Come to find out that Bruce is Bruce Fogel, the author of The Dictionary of the Dog, which is a book that I had had for 15 years and adore. It's, it's my comfort book. Oh, look at this. Oh, look at that. Because I'm a dog crazy without a dog. And then at dinner, he explained that he had come back because our mutual friend had taken one of her dogs who needed to be castrated to the local veterinarian and Bruce had gone along. He is, he is Mr. Vet in England. He's the most, he is the most famous veterinarian in England. And he looked around and Romilly translated when they were talking about what to do and when to do it. And found, thank you, doctor, it was a pleasure to meet you. <laughs> they walked outside, he said, Romilly, I have to go home because I have an operation tomorrow, but I'll be back on Saturday. I'll do the castration. He did not say why, and my friend did not ask why, because the, the vet has been very, very good to the dogs. But um, when he explained what he was going to do and what medicines he was going to use and showed him the, 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 the um, instruments he was going to use, Bruce said, um, I'll come back and do it. And he, he was very, very gracious in this. He came back and he asked if he asked Ronald Lee to set it up so that he could come and observe. Hmm. So he went as an observer and he suggested things and suggested things and did certain things. But he, he, he realized that he didn't want to compromise the other man's professional honor. It's a wonderful story. I am going to be searching for the dictionary of the dog since it's, um, it's we a know. Giant. It's, it's really a, a coffee it? table book. Fabulous. Wow. But it's updated. Our kids have dogs. We have dogs. Um, and, um, you know, they bring a lot of joy to your life, even as I'm mopping up after the little girl who has a, we think, a disease called diabetes insipidus, which means she can't control her intake and outtake of liquids as well as she could. Mm -hmm. And she has to have pills every day, which she loves. So she gets them in a little treat. So, you know, it's not like it's a hardship for her to take the pills. Does, does that stop it? Sorry? Does that stop the problem? Or control um, we, it yes, it is definitely arrested. Unfortunately, there appears to be no actual test for this disease. It's more observational. You know, you give them the medicine and you hope that they drink less and pee less. And, you know, then that's kind of um, an indication that this is what it is. The vet said she's only seen one other case of it, so it's not that easy to um, diagnose. And of course, if you have a, a disease that's very rare, then the pharmaceutical involved is going to be incredibly expensive because you know there's of not course. a big market for it. But fortunately, um, we can do that. So you know, the good news, as I said, is she likes the she loves taking the pills. So it's like an extra treat, so it's not a hardship for. Her. But you know, I mean, if you take in a if you take in a dog, I think or any pet, you know, you really, I think anyway, you're obliged to give them the same care and love and whatever as you do a child. You know, I mean, you can't just take them in and throw them back out if they yeah. are defective. So good or bad, um, you have them. 
Yeah, so there we are. I think this would be a good time to call Patrick back and see if we have um, any questions from the audience. I did oh, forget good. to say that we do have autographed copies of um, Give Unto Others. Donna apparently signed many, many sheets. Um, and so we have those. And we have British copies coming that Donna's going to be signing in London. For those of you who are interested in that, I am because I collect Donna um, from the beginning in the British edition. Um, but anyway, we have choices. So that's wonderful. Patrick. Yes. Yeah, there are some questions. Um, and thanks thanks to everybody for watching on Facebook and YouTube. We always appreciate it. Um, LJ Roberts, our old friend, she says, uh, she asks, do we know how Brunetti and Paola met and got together? Yeah, he met her in the library. They were students at the university and he bumped into her or knocked a book down out of her arms, mistakenly. And he looked up and he was in love. A coup de foudre, as we say yeah. in a different language, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. As simple as that. that. Yeah. Let's see. OK. Uh, Josephine would like to know, how did Donna Leone deal with the Italian political system? By ignoring it. <laughs> because it's. I'm just looking at the same politicians I was looking at 20 years ago and or 30 years ago, 40 years ago, and very little has changed. And so I read the headlines. I read the Gazzettino every day. I read La Nuova Venezia every day. But the other, the other papers, I simply read the headlines. I, I, I can't, I, I, I just, I can't stand it anymore. I really can't stand it. I can't stand some of the people who are representative of, not of the government. Yeah, they are. Salvini is a representative of the government. I, I cannot stand anymore to look at them or listen to them. So I'm, I, I am at the, I'm sort of in a coma to see what happens. And I'll wait until what happens next. All right, let's see here. Uh, you've, you've discussed this a little bit, but um, somebody is curious about what took you to Venice in the first place and maybe how long you lived there and some of those details. I went first as a tourist in the late 60s and I was like Brunetti in the library. I, I bumped into Venice and I was in love. And then I started going back. I was lucky enough to, to make a real friendship with two Venetians, both jewelers, a married couple who, who are still my best friends. After 50, 50 years, more than 50 years, we've been friends. And so I would go back to visit them, to visit them, to visit them. And I acquired many friends in the city. And then finally in, I think it was, and I was back in Venice at least once or twice a year from all, all during the seventies. And then in 80, I think it was in 80, I decided that I'd stop being an academic mercenary and traveling around the world teaching. And I moved to Venice with no job, with no home, and I got lucky. You got lucky in what sense? That you started writing or you got a job? No, no, I got lucky that I got a job. I found a job teaching at an American university so I could live in Italian and, and work in English. And then I got lucky because of the books. And uh, I, I, take, I take no credit for either. It was just, I bent down and picked up the lottery ticket and was a winner. What inspired you to write Death at La Fenice? I mean, it, you know, it's a mystery, but not really a mystery. I mean, I, I'm not sure that your book should have any sort of, well, I'm, I am sure that your books really should not be categorized in any way because they're, they're so embracing of so many things. But, you know, La Fenice, there was a murder, so presumably. I, I, was, I had a conversation with a, a friend of mine who was conducting that. And we started talking about killing another conductor. And I thought, oh, wow, what a great idea for a murder mystery. I wonder if I could write a murder mystery. So I wrote a murder mystery and uh, it, it got published. But it, it was never a dream, an ambition, a longed for goal in my life. I just got the idea one day and, and wondered if I could do that, the way one would wonder if one could make a a pumpkin souffle and so you just you've seen them you've, you've eaten them you watch them you watch people make them okay let me try to do it 
and I did it and it worked. Well, it was successful. So did you then, you know, did you expect to continue writing a, another book about Brunetti or was this? No, 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 it was a one -off. No, 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 right? But then um, Harper Collins, I think it was, asked for a second book. And I said, yeah, sure, why not? And then they asked for two more. And then it was, it was too late to say no. And then I just got into the habit of writing a book a year because it was fun. And it, it remains enormous fun to write these books because as I suppose is evident, they have become in a sense more unhinged as, as time passes. The first books were really crime books where the bloodhound Brunetti went after fresh meat, but the, they've become much more discursive as time passes. And there's much more said that has absolutely nothing to do with the murder at hand or with the crime at hand. And I find that that's the kind of stuff I would, I would rather write. And often justice is, um, it's not a concrete thing. I mean, justice is affected in Donna's books in various ways, but not necessarily traditional ways. Good, good. So Patrick, any more? Uh, well, I just, it was interesting you said that you went into it with, uh, as if you were going to make a pumpkin souffle, and uh, not too many people kind of make a career out of making a pumpkin souffle <laughs> that's last, lasted 30 years or however long it's been. That's <laughs> very that's, big. Yeah, that's such a great Lots answer. Lots of eggs. Yeah. Um, can you talk a little bit about, um, I know you obviously read widely and draw from all, all sorts of different places in your writing. Um, are there are there writers that you go back to again and again for inspiration? Yeah, I, I am at the moment. I am rereading Trollope. I, I'm a crazy Dickensian. I adore Dickens and think that he is one of the great English novelists. And in the midst of that passion, which lasted for years and years and years, I sort of ignored Trollope. But two or three years ago, I said, well, maybe, maybe. And I just finished Barchester Towers, which people usually read when they're 19. And I was, I was knocked down by how good Trollope is. The, one of the things I, I like very much about him is that he understands women. And Dickens doesn't. Dickens doesn't have a clue. I think this is his great handicap, that women have to be virgins or whores. He, that's the dichotomy in which his feminine characters are forced to exist. But Trollope understands women. And he writes like an angel. And I'm go. I haven't. I haven't been in an English language bookstore for more than two years. I don't buy books online. I buy books in bookstores. And in two weeks, in ten days, I am going to London. And my hotel is right around the corner from John's bookstore. And I'm putting down my suitcase and going to the bookstore. I, I feel I, I've never done drugs, but I feel like a drug addict who hasn't had any cocaine for two years. And I'm going to the cocaine store in two weeks. And I have, a, I have a second bag to take books back to. I can it sounds say. absolutely wonderful, Donna. I'm sure you all <laughs> love it. Do you, I don't know if you can remember, but down years ago, and unfortunately it hasn't held up all that well, um, there was an amazing dramatization of the Pallisers which is Trollope's, you know, great, um, great saga with the Duke of Omnium and so forth, is actually Derek Jacobi got his um, start in, um, as Lord Fawn in that mm -hmm. series. And I absolutely loved it. We tried to watch it again recently and, and it doesn't, the, the production values are so, so mm -hmm. poor compared to how it is today. But I remember being so gripped by, you know, that it's whole- gripping. Absolutely. I mean, you can read the Eustace Diamonds separately, but you know, um, I think I think Trollope was amazing, and and he wrote every day before he went to work. I think it was at the post office, wasn't yeah, he? The post office. Yeah. Um, so he was an incredibly prolific writer, but um, managed to do it all while maintaining a full time job. So, you you talked about production values. About two years ago, I discovered on YouTube. I, Claudius. I watched I, Claudius in the 70s. And I didn't go out on whatever night it was right. because 
you couldn't do that then. There was no recording. And I thought it was glorious. I watched it again and it's glorious. The production values are, are terrible. People wear, they were wearing window curtains as togas. Yeah. And the, the swords were, the swords looked like this. But the text, the script is so good. And the, you, I thought of it because of Derek Jacobi. Jacobi, right. Claudius. He's amazing as, as Claudius. Um, he, I think he's a phenomenal actor. And I wish that that Edith Parchett or, or Ellis Peters, you know, Brother Cadvales, he was also Brother Cadvale. I wish that they had been better done because the books are fabulous. And he's mm -hmm. a wonderful actor, but I didn't think that the series was all that successful. But, but are you an I, Claudius fan? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I remember, you know, I remember also racing home on Sunday nights to watch Poldark in the original, um, you know, which I loved and I'm not nearly as fond of the new version, but sadly, a lot of them haven't, haven't held up um, for the production values. And I, I keep hoping some genius will go back and, you know, manage to remaster some of those well, things I, in a way that we'll love. Matter. It doesn't matter that they're dressed up in the tablecloth because <laughs> the acting, the, no, the acting is yeah. just so, so superior. And the text when when what's her name Livia, the yeah. wicked wicked Livia is dying. She calls her her nephew, and she says, "Nephew, nephew, you must promise me. What is it, Aunt? You must promise me that you'll do what I ask. What is it, Aunt? I'm about to die, Claudius. I want you to make me a goddess." Right. And I remember Caligula. Caligula was fabulous. Well, we digress. Patrick, back to back to the subject at hand. Any other That's questions right. for Donna? Diversion. We always digress. Donna and I tend to roam around the universe when we start talking. Didn't didn't Robert Graves write that uh, wonderful yeah. World War One menu uh, memoir as well? Um, yes, I can't remember the name. Something yeah. looking back or. I don't know what the name is. But right, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Wonderful. An, an amazing writer. But I think I, Claudius is the work of genius. I mean, to read it or to watch it, either way. And the next, the, the second book, Claudius the God, is, it isn't, isn't up to par. I, I don't think. He wrote himself out with them. They yeah, were all so wicked. They're, they're kind of a quiet bunch. I keep asking him, here's your chance. You have Donna Leone here. Mm. And uh, I think they're just having such a, a nice time watching this conversation. Well, yeah, tuning. I hope they're tuning into I Claudius on, on uh, YouTube. <laughs> we may have created a renaissance for the Pallisers and I Claudius. Harry, absolutely wonderful. Well, it is the joy to read every Donna Leon book. I'm so glad that she writes Thank one you. book a year. Very kind and of it's you March um, when they come out, and um, I Donna is one of the few authors that I have collected over the years. So I have all of her books, and I love going back. And looking into them, in addition to the Brunetti, you've written two or three uh, books about Venice or aspects of Venice um, that are a real delight. Are you thinking of any more of those? Or are you sticking to the novels? No, I'm, st I'm sticking to the novels. I occasionally write um, pieces, short essays. There's a book coming out, but I believe it's coming out only in German this winter, which is a collection of a lot of essays, some of which appeared in, in one of the essay books, but most of which are new. Things that things I never talked about or, or wrote about. One is the the four years I spent in Iran as a supposedly a teacher of English to Iranian helicopter pilots. When in reality I spent my time playing tennis. I spent four years <laughs> I, oh. I spent no really I did oh it was drug sex and rock and roll it really was. I spent four years supposedly working in the testing office of a company that was teaching Iranian helicopter pilots enough English to, to understand the instruction that they got. But in reality, I realized that the, the work was ridiculous. We, we were just boondoggling the poor Iranians. And so I, I asked my tennis partner, who was about 15 years younger than I am in great shape, if we could play tennis every day, because he had another boondoggle job too. So he picked me up at 10 o'clock in the morning. We'd go play tennis until three in the afternoon every day for three and a half years. Wow. So it was almost like a health vacation for you. <laughs> How wonderful. Yeah. 
Great. Val, well, thank you very much for spending time with us this morning or this evening in your case. This Donna. Never I, I certainly am glad that um, those of you who are watching it live or those of you who will watch it because this will stay up forever on our Facebook and YouTube pages and eventually there will be a podcast. Um, give on to others. You can read it. Um, if you've never read a Donna Leon Guido Bernetti book, you can read it as it is, or you can, like me, fortunately, they're all still in print, which is not that easy anymore for an author of a long series. But luckily, you can start with Death at La Fenice and read your way forward, should you somehow or other have missed this. You have a spare season. year. <laughs> and we will look forward to, do tell me, is the next book already written? Do we have that to look forward to? I finished it yesterday. Oh, bravo. Yeah. No, I, 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 got, I got on a roll. And um, the last two weeks, I've been doing nothing but finish, finish the book. Now I have to go back to chapter one and line everything up. And that's for, <laughs> that's for next year, but it's finished. Wonderful. You have a oh, title for it? Excuse me? A title? Yeah. No. No, no, no. No. Not yet. Uh, I'm sure I'll get one. I'll find one. Well, how encouraging to know that we have one to look forward to. I'm, I do think the titles for the books have been terrific over the years. And Give Unto Others, I think, is a particularly good title for this yeah. book, just like Transient Desires was an excellent one. You know, the one about the lagoons, which one was that, Donna? That was one of my very favorites. And I thought I really Something liked Something Remains. Earthly Remains? Was it Earthly Remains? I think so, yeah. Or The Waters of Eternal Youth? No, 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 no. That's a long time ago. Okay. Well, in any case, um, I think the titles are, are wonderful and definitely represent um, the themes of the books and wonderful. Anyway, um, thank you very much for joining thank us. You. Enjoy the rest of your day or in your case, the rest of your evening. Mm -hmm. Bye. Thank you. Ciao. Uh -huh. ciao, ciao, ciao. Adio is what you say. Adio. Adio. Ciao, Patrick. Grazie. Hello. We hope you're enjoying our programs and podcasts with authors. We'd like to expand them, and your help would be appreciated. Please make a donation at poisonedpenfoundation.org. 100% of the proceeds will go to help connect authors with readers in this difficult time. Thank you.